This video is brought to you by Bright Sellers. Bright Sellers send you wine, which is awesome enough, but better than that, they introduce you to new wines that you'll probably love. And look, I'm a pretty big wine fan and I like discovering new wines to drink and enjoy, but what makes Bright Sellers quite so clever is that they maximize the chances that you're going to love the wine they send. You take a short quiz, no snobbery about what you like, and they send you a box of wine based on your preferences. And it's a guarantee you like them. If you don't, they'll ship you another bottle with your next delivery, so you can't really lose. Well, what else? Well, you can choose how much they send, and of course, it's delivered to wherever you want, making everything super, super easy. Plus, each box comes with a wine education card so you can learn just a little bit about what you're drinking. Bright Sellers is giving you guys 50% off your first six bottle box. Follow the link in the description below and take the quiz to get started, and let's get into the video. Today, we're taking a look at a few bloody chapters from the history of crime. In one way or another, all of these cases shocked, repulsed, and thrilled the public in their day, but they all had one thing in common. None of these murders were ever officially solved. Number 8. The Hinterkaifeck Murders In the early 20th century, there was a little farmstead situated roughly halfway between the German towns of Ingolstadt and Schrobenhausen in Bavaria. It belonged to the Gruber family and was known as Hinterkaifeck. Andreas Gruber lived there with his wife, his adult daughter, two young grandchildren, and a maid. On March 31, 1922, all six of them were killed with rusty farm tools. Who did it? and why remains a mystery to this day. After a while, the locals began to notice their absence. The entire family missed church on Sunday, and young Kazelia hadn't attended school several days in a row. Eventually, a few of them went to the farmstead where they discovered the horrid scene. Most of the Grubers had been murdered in the barn, presumably lured inside one at a time. The maid, Maria Baumgartner, and the two-year-old baby, Joseph Gruber, were killed inside the house. At first, police suspected one or more vagrants, but dismissed the idea since the house had not been disturbed and money was left where it was. Even more curiously, the killer or killers spent time at the farm after the murders, lighting fires, eating food, and even feeding the animals. Afterwards, suspicions were directed towards some of the locals, particularly one Lorenz Schlittenbauer, who was rumored to be the father of young Joseph Gruber. An even more sordid rumor says that Andreas Gruber was actually the father of his own grandchild after having an incestuous relationship with his daughter Victoria. Lastly, there was Victoria's actual husband, Carl Gabriel, who was purportedly killed in World War I, but one hypothesis claimed he survived, returned home, and killed the family in anger when he found out that his wife had had a baby with another man. These are just three of the most pervasive notions regarding what happened at Hinterkaifeck. There are many more, but no evidence to prove any of them. Number 7. The Green Bicycle Case On the night of July 5, 1919, 21-year-old Bella Wright was shot and killed outside a tiny English village called Little Stratton in Leicestershire. The only clue the police had to go on was that she was seen earlier that evening in the company of a man riding a green bicycle. This might sound like a setup for a mystery novel, but it ended up becoming one of England's most notorious and controversial murders of the early 20th century. The controversy stems from the fact that the authorities always had a solid suspect. His name was Ronald Light. He was 33 years old, and not only did he own a green bicycle, but he tried to get rid of it after the crime. He also threw away a pistol holster with bullets that matched the one that killed Bella Wright. Lastly, he reluctantly admitted to being the man on the green bicycle that night after eyewitnesses identified him. All of this built a strong case for Light's guilt, and yet he was acquitted in 1920. His attorney, the venerable Sir Edward Marshall Hall, pointed out that all the circumstantial evidence merely indicated that Light and Wright rode together that night for a while, something which his client had already admitted. None of it suggested that Light had anything to do with Wright's death or that he was even present at the time. The main scenario advanced by Hall was that the young woman was killed by a ricochet from someone hunting in a nearby field. He argued argued that a close-range shot would have caused a lot more damage to the face, whereas the actual bullet hole was so small that the first doctor who inspected the body actually missed it. Moreover, he pointed at Light's complete lack of motive for the killing, and he even put his clients on the stand to testify and show off his calm demeanor and soft-spokenness. Clearly, he won over the jury, who unanimously agreed that Ronald Light was not guilty. Ever since then, crime buffs have been left to wonder 
what really happened that night. Number six, the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. We move on to the unsolved case of a serial killer active in the United States decades ago. He preyed on young couples in secluded areas. He, he killed five people that we know of. He shot all of his victims, but some of them survived. He was never identified, so he was referred to by a nickname in the media. The police did have one solid suspect, but could never positively tie him to the murders. Some of you crime buffs might be spotting a lot of similarities to the notorious Zodiac murders, but in fact, we're talking about a string of killings that occurred over two decades prior and are mostly forgotten today, while the Zodiac still remains one of America's most notorious criminals. They were the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, perpetrated by someone dubbed by the media as the Phantom Killer or the Phantom Slayer. The murders occurred in and around the sister cities of Texarkana, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas, between February and May of 1946. They were investigated by the Texas Rangers, who suspected a man named Yoel Swinney of the killings. He was a lifelong petty criminal, and it was his wife who first brought him to the police's attention, though she later refused to testify against him. Swinney was imprisoned the following year, but on unrelated car theft charges. Eventually, the trail went cold as investigators moved on to other cases, and the identity of of the Phantom Killer remained a mystery. Number five, the beautiful cigar girl. Fans of detective stories might be familiar with the mystery of Marie Roget by Edgar Allan Poe. What they may not know is that Poe's story of the murder of a perfume saleswoman in Paris was based on the actual murder of Mary Cecilia Rogers from New York City. 22-year-old Mary Rogers disappeared on July 25, 1841, and her body was found three days later in Hoboken, New Jersey, floating in the Hudson River. Mary Rogers was considered a very beautiful young woman, and the tobacco store where she worked as a clerk was often filled with men who bought something just so they could flirt with her. Therefore, her death caused a frenzy as the media dubbed her the Beautiful Cigar Girl. Truth of the matter is that we cannot even say with certainty that she was murdered. After three days in the water, her remains were damaged and swollen. There were extensive bruises on her body and what looked like a ligature mark on her throat, both of which suggested she had been assaulted. In fact, the most popular theory of the police at the time was that she had been a victim of gang violence. Other ideas suggested that Mary died during a failed abortion or that her fiancé, Daniel Payne, was involved. Payne allegedly had an airtight alibi for the night of her death, but remained a suspect in the public mind after committing suicide a few months later and leaving behind a note asking for forgiveness for his misspent life. Eventually, once all the sordid details were out in the open, people started to lose interest and the newspapers moved on to the next story, leaving the death of Mary Rogers unsolved to this day. Number 4. The Shimayama Incident In 1949, Japan experienced three deadly incidents involving its railway system. A train was derailed in Fukushima, another one was crashed into Tokyo's Mitaka Station, and lastly, our focus today, the first president of the Japanese National Railways, Sadanori Shimayama, disappeared on July 5th and was found the following day, his body severed after being run over by a train. Obviously, given the temporal proximity between the three events, many immediately suspected that Shimayama's death was caused by the same group of people responsible for the other incidents. Those who believed the three were connected generally suspected radical union members who were also affiliated with the Japanese Communist Party. Even if they weren't involved, there was a very long list of people who may have wanted to harm Shimayama. As the president of the railway network, he was responsible for personnel cutbacks that saw tens of thousands of workers lose their jobs. This gave investigators a giant suspect pool, but also a motive for possible suicide. Some believed that Shimayama killed himself due to stress and guilt over the layoffs. Authorities of that time conducted a tight-lipped investigation. Eventually, they closed the case without any arrests and never disclosed any details. It wasn't until in recent decades that hundreds of documents from the investigation were made public, but it brought us no closer to solving Shimayama's death. Number 3. The Ardlemont Mystery For this case, we travel to Argyll, Scotland, to Ardlemont House, the estate that once belonged to the Hambra family. In 1891, the family accepted a new person into their ranks, 30-year-old Alfred John Monson, who was there to serve as gentleman's tutor for 18-year-old Cecil Hambra. Two years later, on August 10, 1893, Monson took Cecil for a day's hunting. Accompanying them was an acquaintance of Monson named Edward Scott. At one point, shots rang out of the forest, and the servants then saw only Monson and Scott returning back with the guns. The duo claimed that Cecil Hambra had accidentally shot himself in the head by discharging his weapon while climbing a fence. 
An investigation was launched immediately, but there was no suspicion of foul play at first, as there was seemingly no motive. A few weeks after Cecil's death, however, authorities discovered that just a few days before the shooting, the young aristocrat took out two life insurance policies and for some reason named Monson's wife as beneficiary. Now there was motive, so police arrested Monson and charged him with murder, while his accomplice, Edward Scott, went on the run. The trial itself was notable for featuring the testimony of Joseph Bell, the Scottish surgeon who inspired Arthur Conan Doyle to create Sherlock Holmes. He was of the opinion that Monson had shot young Cecil Hambra. Even so, Alfred Monson was acquitted after the jury returns the Scottish verdict of not proven used in Scots law when neither side can definitively make their case. The story of the Ardenmont murder had a strange epilogue the following year. Because the case was infamous in its time, Madame Tussauds, the Wax Museum in London, created a waxworth of Alfred Monson and placed it in the Chamber of Horrors alongside other notorious killers. He successfully sued them for libel and established a legal precedent that wax figures can give rise to libelous accusations. Number 2. The Murder of Mull McCarthy On November 21, 1940, Mary Mull McCarthy was gunned down in a rundown old cottage in Marl Hill, a small village in County Tipperary in Ireland. Sometime later, a neighbor by the name of Henry Gleeson, usually referred to as Harry, found her body and reported her death to the police. Gleeson was subsequently arrested, convicted, and hanged for the murder of Mull McCarthy. It sounds like a brutal but straightforward case. Gleason even had a motive. McCarthy originally worked as a prostitute and had several children by multiple men. Gleason was said to be one of them, except that his child died in infancy, so he killed McCarthy out of anger. And yet, in the decades since the crime occurred, it came to be regarded as one of the most egregious miscarriages of justice in Irish history as more and more people lobbied for Gleason's innocence. It culminated in 2015 when, for the first time in the state's history, the President of Ireland gave him a posthumous pardon. All signs suggested that the authorities executed an innocent man, but, well, who was the real killer then? The other fathers of McCarthy's children would have made strong suspects, considering that many of them were married. Unsurprisingly, given the way the case was handled, there was also talk of a cover-up. Crime buffs suggested that the real culprit could have been a member of the local Gardaí or the IRA, with Gleason serving as a convenient patsy. Number 1. The Teal Pond Mystery The early 1990s saw the premiere of a surreal and captivating show called Twin Peaks, centered around the mysterious murder of a young woman named Laura Palmer. However, the inspiration for the show came from a scary story that co-creator Mark Frost heard from his grandmother when he was a boy, the real-life murder of Hazel Drew. This happened all the way back in 1908 in a little town in New York State called Sand Lake. Hazel Drew was a 20-year-old woman who disappeared on the night of July the 7th with her body washing ashore on the banks of the local pond four days later. She had a corset string around her neck and a head injury from a blunt object. Plus, there was no water in her lungs, indicating that she was dead before going into the pond. The details surrounding the investigation were very reminiscent of Twin Peaks. The list of suspects included a dim-witted farm boy, a peddler of charcoal, a dentist named Edwin North who was in love with the victim, and even a man who was said to possess hypnotic powers. There was also some sordid gossip which alleged that Hazel Drew led a double life by taking part in orgies with older businessmen. Modern sleuths who combed through the documents and newspaper reports from that time suggest that the local authorities were keen to dismiss the notion that there was a murderer in their little town. Instead, they put forward the idea that Hazel Drew had been run over by a reckless driver who then tried to get rid of the body by dumping it in the pond. While not impossible, it was inconsistent with the victim's injuries, and the Teal Pond mystery, as it came to be known, remains unsolved. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Also, if you want to support this show and get some wine while you're at it, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Bright Sellers, who I'm linking to below. Thank you for watching.